All right. So I think it was just a few days ago, um, I was reflecting on my day. I was in my house. I was in one of the rooms that no one else was in. You know, wife and kids were in the living room. I think this was actually my bedroom. And uh, I was thinking about something that happened earlier in the day that didn't go quite the way that I wanted it to go. I didn't say what I was wanting to say, didn't do what I was wanting to do. And because I was in the quietness of my own room, I out loud verbally said this, you are an idiot. And then I started thinking about like what happened and I added a little something to it. I said out loud, you are such an idiot. You guys ever had one of those moments before? Like some of you are raising your hand, others are like, no, I would never talk like that to myself. But have you ever had someone talk to you that way? <laughs> Maybe it's a spouse just reminding you, honey, you are such an idiot. Now, I think we've all, whether or not you've heard this recently or not, I think all of us have at least heard that beginning part of that sentence. Maybe we've spoken that beginning part of the sentence. Maybe we've had it spoken over us. You know, things like, you are fat. You are fantastic. You are fake. You are funny. We've heard these words. We've spoken these words. And I think however you or however other people finish that sentence can have a profound impact on our identity and also our destiny. And so what we're going to do is we're going to be entering a new sermon series uh, for the next four weeks where we're going to allow Jesus, we're going to allow the Word of God to actually finish that sentence for us. And so today what we're going to be talking about, uh, talking about is how Jesus actually says you are invited. Next week we're going to look at how Scripture says that you're actually invaluable. Week three, we're going to talk about how you are actually influential. And then week four, we're going to look at how you are invested. Uh, again, going back to um, maybe about a month, maybe a month and a half ago, uh, I was in a conversation with somebody in our community. And it was one of those fun conversations where you're just trying to get to know each other. So you're talking a little bit about what you do and you're talking a little bit about family dynamics. And uh, they were sharing what they do. And then it came out that I was a pastor and, oh, a pastor of Anderson Christian Church. Okay. And then he explained that he and his daughter actually took advantage or has multiple years taken advantage of our Trunkapalooza event. If you're not sure what our Trunkapalooza event is, it's our, one of our biggest outreach, if not one of, it, probably the biggest outreach that we do all year round, uh, all, all year long um, around, uh, around Halloween. And so hundreds and hundreds of people in our community go. And so he had taken advantage of it and he explained that his daughter loves it and they get lots of candy and a lot of fun time and good food. And, and I thought this would be the perfect transition to like invite him to church. So that's what I did. I was like, well, if you thought that was great and you should definitely take advantage of what we're doing on Sundays and Wednesdays, we've got a great children's program. Like your daughter would love it. And then he said something I wasn't expecting him to say. He looked at me and he said, well, I sincerely appreciate that, sir. But when you're trash like me, you've got to be careful what church you attend. And honestly, I was not expecting him to say that. I wasn't even sure what he meant by that. And so I dug a little bit deeper just to kind of figure out, what do you, what do you mean by that? And he painted kind of this vague picture of how he has actually gone to churches. And he did not feel very invited. He did not feel very welcomed. And even while he was talking, I thought to myself, how is that possible? Like, you actually have taken your daughter to churches. And I'm just thinking this. You've taken your daughter to churches, and you have not felt welcome and invited? And then I took a step back, and I just tried to evaluate him, and not in a judgmental way, but I just kind of looked at, okay, well, this is, these are the clothes that he's wearing. Uh, this is kind of the mannerisms, the way he's talking. Uh, I thought about maybe some of the physical features that he had. I thought about the stories that he's already told me about a broken you know, marriage and how he's distant um, from his wife and barely has even a little bit of custody of his daughter. And I thought, okay, maybe, maybe that is true. Maybe it's true that there are some churches that would not invite him in and would not invite his daughter in. And when I had that realization, it was convicting, but at the same time, I just hurt for him. And you know, I hurt for him because I've been there. And I think some of you have been there as well. You know, when we're born into this world, we're born with a ton of needs and no ability to actually meet any of those needs. We're born into this world and you need to be fed and you need to be clothed and you need to have shelter and you need a mother, a father, some sort of caregiver to give you all of those things. When you poop and you pee, they have to check your diaper and say, yep, yep, we got to take care of this thing too. And it's not just the physical needs. There's something else going on. In fact, I don't know if you've thought about this, but with every tear that's, that's actually shed, with every cry that, that you make, what are you really crying out for? 
you're not just crying for those physical needs, you're also crying out for love and acceptance. And something uh, really amazing takes place in our lives. When you are rocked, when you are cuddled, when you are kissed, when you are you're held, you're actually, this immaterial thing that we call love, this thing that you cannot look at underneath a microscope, this thing that you can't cut with a scalpel in a laboratory, suddenly is becoming internalized inside of you. When these needs are met, whether it's physical, uh, whether it's spiritual, like there's something biological, there's something physiological, there's something psychological and spiritual taking place. You are experiencing love and acceptance, and it's healthy, and this is actually how God has created you to experience life. But we also know that in our world, well, it's not a perfect world. And there are times where we have cried out for love, we've cried out for acceptance, and there's been something else that has filled that void. Maybe it happened early in life. Maybe you had a friend, and they liked you, and you liked them, and you spent all your time together, and then all of a sudden, they spent less time with you and more time with other friends, and the divide got wider and wider, and you cried out for acceptance, but they said, no, I'm more interested in hanging out with these people. What fills your heart at that moment? Maybe it's the excitement, you worked on a project and you were excited about the project and you brought it to school and you're expecting people to appreciate your project but you received criticism and you received a poor grade from a teacher. What fills your little heart? Even now, when we make a comment, sometimes we're teased, sometimes we're made fun of. Some of you, you've been dumped before, you've been divorced before. What fills our hearts? Oftentimes it's shame. Shame ends up replacing that, that void. You're looking for love, you're looking for acceptance, but instead shame enters your heart. And you might get to a point that you end up starting to make comments like, well, when you're trash like us, you've got to be careful about what church you attend. Otherwise, shame will get stacked on top of shame, on top of shame, and that is a very painful place to be. But I think we've all been there. I think we've all experienced the shame of life. And so I want to introduce you uh, If nothing else, I want to reintroduce you to a central truth of the gospel message, the good news of Jesus. And that is this, that Jesus invites the people that others reject. I'm going to say that again. I want you to let it just kind of wash over your your soul just for a moment. Jesus invites the people that others reject. I want that to transform your own personal identity, but I also want it to, to shape our culture as a church that we understand that Jesus has invited us, and so we become people who invite the people that others reject. Today, we're going to be in Luke chapter 7. If you want to grab your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 7. And while you're turning, let me kind of give you a rundown on where we're at in his ministry. So again, this is like 2,000 years ago. Jesus has begun his ministry, and he's doing things, and he's saying things that other teachers of the day are not doing, and they're not saying He's doing things that it's like, how did you physically, like, how did that happen? How were you able to perform that type of miracle? People are blown away by it. And then the way he teaches, it's like, that's not how our teachers teach. And some of the things he's even saying about himself, they don't even know what to make of it. You know, things like, before Abraham was, I am. Things like, when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I and the Father are one. These are all things that point to his deity, and people are like, I don't know how you did that. And I don't even know how you can say that. Uh, I don't know if this mixes well with each other. But one of the things that most people, I think, at least early on in his ministry, would have bought into is that he probably would have been in league. Jesus, they just kind of picture Jesus as his teacher, his prophet. He probably would have been you know, in league, at least with the Pharisees. Like These were the religious leaders of the time. These were the ones who were most outwardly pious. They were the ones that knew God's law really, really well, and they did their best to actually live it out. They were the ones that had the really nice outfits, right? Nice, long, flowing robes. They had these elaborate tassels. They would you know, be able to pray these amazing prayers to the point where everyone's like, oh my gosh, you, you must be communing with God. You were so good at that prayer thing. Uh, they were the ones that they knew all the ritual, like washings, just super impressive people. And so they would have seen Jesus, and they would have seen these Pharisees, and they're like, yeah, these, these guys are pretty close. Um, to the point where one of these Pharisees actually is uh, is able to invite Jesus to a party. Now, when you think (coughs) of a party, you know, our minds immediately go to like 21st century parties. In fact, if I were to maybe invite some of you, hey, we've got this party at my house, uh, you'd be probably thinking, okay, tonight, 
you know, the pastor, he's going to like grill up some hot dogs, right? Maybe be listening to some, some music, <clears throat> the latest worship songs, possibly. Maybe if he's daring, maybe some of the pop culture, you know, songs that are out there. Who knows? Uh, and that's what our minds go to. That's it's kind of a 21st century party. Um, not so. Not so in the first century. That's not what a party looked like. So I'm like, well, yeah, hot dogs. What if it was a Hebrew national, like, beef, like, kosher hot dog? Would they eat him then? Possibly. Possibly they would have. But I don't know if they'd be, like, jamming to... Harry Styles, like watermelon sugar. That's probably, that's probably not what's going to happen at those parties. So what would a, a party look like in the first century, particularly one that maybe a Pharisee would invite you to? This would be an opportunity to show off. Like, like that would be one of those hidden agendas at these parties. Because they would meet in a home, and most homes had what would be referred to as an outer room, and that's where the meals would be had, but that's also where the conversation would be made. And this was a time for those deep thinkers, these intellectual elites, they would show off their deep theological thoughts, and they would come ready to discuss these deep things. And what was interesting is these outer, um, outer rooms would oftentimes be surrounded by a, a porch, And even those in the community who were actually not invited to the party, it was completely socially acceptable and even expected that other people from the community would come and then hang out on the porch and they'd leave the door open so that they could listen in on all the really cool conversations. And that's one of the reasons why it was time to show off, because people were listening, not just in the party, but out there, and they wanted to impress everybody with their deep theological ideas. And so this is certainly what would have happened. Jesus is invited, and his disciples are invited, and this is just a great opportunity to show off. But there's someone who shows up at the party who is not invited. And the religious leaders there, the Pharisees there, hate every moment of this. Turn, if you haven't already, to Luke chapter 7. We're going to start reading in verse 37. It says, a woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. So a woman in this community hears about the party, hears that Jesus is an invited guest, and so she shows up, but she doesn't hang out on the porch. She actually enters the party. And this is is Luke's way, this whole, you know, she was a sinful woman. This is Luke's very polite way of saying that she is a prostitute, that this is a well-known prostitute in the community. And so I want you to kind of put yourself in this story. Some of you have heard you know, sermons preached on this. You've read this, maybe studied this yourself. I want you to just kind of put yourself into this moment, and I want you to think, what would you, what would be going on in your mind? Maybe you're one of the Pharisees, one of the religious leaders. Maybe you were actually in the middle of having this really great thought, and it was one of those drop the mic, oh my goodness, how did you come up with this moment? And then this, this, this call girl like enters the room. And maybe the first thought you're having is, like, who invited her? And you look at your buddy, and you're like, maybe this dude did. And you're like, mm-hmm. and he's like, no, not me. And he looks at you, and he's like, and you're like, not me. And, you're like, and, and it dawns, and you're like, no one's invited this girl. What is she doing here? What is she doing here? You know, this is one of those questions that we're going to get to. Um, but I think we first need to understand that this girl, although she wasn't invited, she had clearly lived a sinful life. She has clearly um, probably got the shame on top of shame. I think it's important for us just to understand her story in the context that she probably did not intend for her life to end up where it currently is at. Can we all agree that when she was a little girl, that was probably not the career choice that she was going for? I mean, imagine, she's eight years old. She's hanging out with her other little eight-year-old friends. Maybe they're at a sleepover, and they're just talking about life in general, and one of the Girls are like, oh, yeah, I'm really into YouTube. I would love to become YouTube famous at some point. And they're like, oh, yeah, you can totally do it, girl. Yeah, you can do it. And, and then another one's like, oh, I'd like to go into real estate. And another one says, I, I love animals, and I want to be a veterinarian. And then this girl pipes up and says, you know what I'd like to do, guys? Don't tell anyone, but I would love to become a hooker <laughs> with my very own pimp, right? That if, I, if I work hard enough and I apply myself, I really... Like, she never said that. That never came out of her mouth. That was never a thought in her head. But that's where she's at in life. And then we think to ourselves, well, how did you get there? I mean, you had to make these choices. 
And although you may not have wanted to end up there, you clearly made some choices that led to this. What was it? Well, scripture doesn't tell us, but I think we can make some assumptions. I mean, what, what leads people into that lifestyle even today? You know, maybe she had you know, parents that just did not protect her from the negative influences that are all around us. And what did she do? Well, she made some poor choices, and those poor choices just started to spiral to the point where that's what she was doing. Maybe, on the other hand, maybe she had parents, but they were abusive parents. And she cried out for love. She cried out for acceptance, but she received rejection, and she received, she received punishment, even when she was trying to do you know, what kids try to do, to live up to their parents' expectation. And so shame filled her heart, and then she realized that maybe she can find some love and acceptance just by giving herself away. And so she moved into this type of work. You know, in the first century, you know, mortality rates, uh, you, you died earlier. It's possible that mom and dad died an early death. And so she was at a point where, how am I going to take care of myself? And so in an act of desperation, she finds herself selling herself and hating herself every single day for the choices that she's making. Maybe she met a guy, right? Those guys who are able to say all the right things and do all the right things. And then she finds herself pregnant. And unfortunately, the dad doesn't want to be a dad. And so he leaves. And in that culture, again, shame is a big deal. And she might have been ostracized from her family and socially ostracized. And so what else, what a choice does she have? And she moved into that type of lifestyle. We don't know. We're, we're, we're just making guesses. But I think it's safe to say that this was not the intention of her life. But this is where she finds herself. And I think some of us, we are finding ourselves in similar situations. Like you're looking at your life and you're thinking, okay, yeah, when I was eight, I didn't necessarily expect to be where I'm at right now. I didn't think that physically I would be struggling like I am right now. My body unable to do the things that I want my body to be able to do. You know, I never thought that I would be divorced. I didn't think I would be divorced twice. I didn't think that I would have such a strained relationship with this child that I loved so much. But yet, every single time we have a conversation, it's like, World War II all over again. And I think there's moments in all of our lives where we look and we say, how did we get here? This is where she's at. You know, she didn't, she didn't plan this, but this is where she's at. And so she enters this room. How is she going to be responding? How, how are people going to respond to her? Right? She's not invited. So what does she do? And eventually, how are people responding to it? Verse 20, uh, 38. It says, as she stood behind him, stood behind Jesus, at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. You know, there's a lot of different elements that are going on that I think are noteworthy. Um, But I want to focus on primarily the perfume for just a moment. Uh, I think you've probably heard messages that, you know, a woman, you know, approaching a man, huge faux pas at the time, Uh, even this whole idea of letting her hair down, like you just didn't do those things. But I think it's really important just to notice that this woman, what does she do when she meets Jesus? She gives Jesus her most valuable possession. Most valuable possession she probably owned was this perfume. Most historians all agree that this would have been ridiculously expensive. It could have actually cost her a year's worth of wages. So this is really, really expensive perfume. What does she do? She gives it to Jesus. This is the best that I have, and I want to give it to you. What is she doing? She's, she's worshiping Jesus. She's actually giving up her safety net. She's giving up her savings, and she's giving it to Jesus. At the same time, she's actually giving up her future, at least her former future, if that makes sense. She's given up a little bit of the life that she had been living. And here's how this works. So because perfume was so expensive, normal women just didn't have it. They couldn't afford it. And you can imagine, this, this is like, um, this is like a, a prostitute's calling card or a billboard. So imagine a, a man is walking down the street, and as he's walking, he just kind of smells the air. He's like, well, that smells wonderful. And he, he looks over and he sees a woman there. Clearly, she's the one that smells so wonderful. She's the one that's wearing the perfume. This was a billboard advertisement that says, I am one who is willing to sell my body. But what does she do? She gives that up. And so in this act, she is simultaneously worshiping Jesus, giving her the best, giving him the best of what she has, and at the same time, she is moving towards repentance. She's worshiping Jesus, but at the same time, in her heart, in her posture, in her tears, she is 
moving towards repentance. But again, she's an uninvited guest. So how's Jesus going to respond? How are all these Pharisees going to respond? Let's find out. Verse 39. When the Pharisees, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner, that she is a prostitute. So this man uh, that we're going to find out his name is Simon. Um, he just assumes that, well, Jesus can't be who he says he is uh, because there's no way a prophet, there's no way that someone who's actually from God, there's no way that a Savior, the Messiah, would allow, first of all, wouldn't know who's touching him. And then once he knows who's touching him, there is no way a man from God would allow this woman to be touching him. How's Jesus feel about this? Let's drop down to verse 44. Do you see this woman? I came into your house, you did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped, stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. <gasps> Can he say that? Right? But Jesus, Jesus does things that other people aren't doing. And he says things that other people don't say. Why? Because he is not like just anybody. What prompted this woman to do this in the first place? Like, when we enter situations that are awkward and uncomfortable, typically we want to run from those things, right? I, I mean, we... We don't even like job interviews. Most of us, we get a little stressed out, a little anxious about job interviews. But at least you're invited to a job interview. This woman, uninvited, walks into what would be almost certain rejection, most certainly more shame for the life that she's lived. Why? Why would she do this? Why would she come into this room? We don't know. We don't know. But again, I think we can make some, some assumptions and be safe making those assumptions. I think one of the assumptions that it's safe to make is that she most likely had an encounter with Jesus before this moment. That at some point she heard a teaching. Maybe she saw a miracle. Maybe even earlier that day, at the back end of a crowd, because she didn't want to mix in with everyone else, she overheard Jesus' teaching. And something about what he said, something about what he did, just drew her to him. What was it? What was the teaching? We don't know. We don't know. Particularly in the Gospel of Luke, it doesn't really give us a whole lot of indication. But earlier in this chapter, in the chapter uh, 7 in Luke, what we actually see is um, John the Baptist, he sends some of his disciples to meet with Jesus, to ask Jesus some questions. And, and if you look at that same uh, section of Jesus' ministry in the Gospel of Matthew, well, Matthew has that same story, but then there's some teaching that comes after that story. And it's possible, we don't know this for sure, if this woman encountered Jesus that day, maybe this woman actually heard this teaching of Jesus. I'm going to read to you the, the, the parallel in Matthew, but first of all, I want to paraphrase it. What was it that this woman possibly heard from Jesus? Here's the message in my own words. The message is, you are invited. You are invited into God's family. The Father has sent me to invite you in to his family. Let's look at what he actually says in Matthew. Go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 11. <clears throat> As you turn to Matthew chapter 11, just notice that, again, the same section of Scripture, you know, John is sending these disciples to talk to Jesus. It's right there. And then over here, towards the end of Matthew chapter 11, I want to read to you what she possibly heard, starting in verse 28. What is Jesus' message to this woman, to us? He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says, you are invited. Come, 
Come, anyone who is just burdened by life, any of you who are just tired and you're exhausted because you're trying to live up to everyone else's expectations. You're trying to live up to your own expectations. You're trying to figure out what God wants for you and you just don't feel like you can measure up. Jesus says, take a deep breath. You're invited. You're invited. Come. My burden, it's light. It's easy. Come, all those of you who have been crying out for love, crying out for acceptance, and all you're receiving is is shame and rejection. Come, you are welcome. I will fill you with my love. I will fill you with my grace. I will fill you with my mercies and blessings new every single day. Come, you are invited. Like That's such a good message, isn't it? That's such a powerful invitation, isn't it? And I'd be willing to bet that some of you, maybe you've heard that, maybe you're hearing that for the very first time. Some of you joining us online, maybe this is the first time that you're hearing that Jesus, what does he do? He invites the people others reject. And you're hearing that and you're thinking, yes, that sounds good. And if that's where you're at, whether you've heard it a hundred times or this is the first time, and if it resonates in your heart, I would say you need to respond to it. What do you do with invitations? You either throw the invitation in the trash and come up with some excuse. I've got to wash my hair that night. You know, I've got tons of laundry. I can't, can't be involved in that. Or you say yes to the invitation. And for some of you, you're like, yes, I want, I want that love of, of the Savior. Then you would, you would say yes to him. What does it look like to say yes to the invitation? It starts with a simple prayer, a recognition that Jesus is who he said he was, and then you just simply say, Jesus, I give you my life. That's how it starts. That's not where it ends, but that's where it starts. Jesus, I give you my life. And at some point in this service, whether I'm still talking or not, and if you want to make that a prayer, I would say pray it. Start talking to God about that. But I think most of us in this room, we've heard that invitation. And it was so sweet and it was so wonderful that most of you have said yes to the invitation already. And so I think there's another word in here for us. And I think one of the the things that we need to do is just kind of look at whether or not we're living well like Jesus, whether or not we're extending that invitation. You know, what was it that led this woman to say yes to the invitation? What was it that led this woman to Jesus in the first place? Was it Jesus reminding her of all the mistakes that she's ever made? Was it Jesus like bringing up like, hey, you know what, I'm the Savior, I'm, I'm the Messiah, so I know things about your life. No, what you did last night, whew, man, shameful, shameful stuff. Like, did that lead her to him? Did that lead her to God? Did that lead her to worship and moving towards repentance? No, of course not. It was that, come, come to me. Come to me, all you who are burdened. All those who are, are burdened by life's struggles and shame. That's what drew her. And this is what needs to draw us. And we also need to actually extend it to other people. I think if we don't, we start looking a lot like a country in Africa. I've got a map, we're gonna show you this. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Liberia, but Liberia is actually a relatively small country on on the coast of Africa, West Africa. It, It holds historically the distinction of being the only country in West Africa not to be colonized by one of the European powers. You know who it was colonized by? Get this, former slaves from the United States. No kidding. So back in 1822, there was an organization called the American Colonization Society. And what did they do? They began to send former slaves to colonize this country. The whole idea, the thought was that they could create a new uh, free republic for all these former slaves. And so they put a lot of money behind it, and all these um, thousands and thousands of former slaves willingly went to colonize this country. And so over four decades, over uh, 13,000 went to colonize this new country. Liberia actually stands for land of liberty. That's what it stands for. And so they show up, and this sounds wonderful, this sounds really great, but it ends up not being so wonderful. It ends up not being so great. One of the problems was that when they showed up, well, there was already an indigenous people group that were living there. And these former slaves had little to nothing in common with them, other than maybe the color of their skin. And so what they ended up doing is, instead of kind of 
you know, making a new country with everybody, what they did is they removed themselves from the indigenous population and they created what would be basically a new tribe that they referred to themselves as Americo-Liberians. And they recreated, get this, they recreated basically the American South on the continent of Africa. We've got a picture just to kind of give you an idea of what I'm talking about. So uh, over here on the left, we've got a picture of, you know, South, uh, about 1800s, right? We've got uh, a white family and they've got a slave girl. Now, this is what it looked like in Liberia. We've got a black family who, look, they have a slave, but this is a native. See, what happened was they ended up uh, actually taking away so many uh, basic human rights from the natives. Um, they forced them to work hard labor, and they taxed them with all these weird taxes um, that no one else had to pay except for the natives. And I don't know about you, but when I hear that, that just doesn't sit well, does it? I mean, in my mind, I, I just think to myself, of all the people who should know not to do these things, it should be former slaves who were abused and who were used. Why would they, why would, why would the oppressors suddenly become, uh, or sorry, why would the oppressed suddenly become the oppressors? And I can't get too judgmental because honestly, if I look at the church and I look at Christianity, I have to ask myself the question, you know, if there's a people group on this planet that should be able to invite and welcome and love and give grace and mercy, well, it should be us. But sometimes I think we oftentimes look more like former slaves who have nothing in common with the unchurched, right? What do we do? We withdraw ourselves. We oftentimes create our comfortable little, uh, little tribes and we no longer invite because they don't think the way we think and they don't behave the way that we behave. And all of a sudden, instead of inviting, instead of welcoming, instead of loving, instead of extending grace, well, we're just comfortable in our little bubbles. And if I'm honest with you, even after the conversation with the gentleman that I talked about, right, you, you got to be careful what church you go to when you're trash, like me. After the conversation, there, were, there was generally this thought in my head of maybe our church isn't like the best fit for him and his family. Maybe he wouldn't actually be really invited in. Because honestly, as I started thinking about it, he didn't talk like I talked. He didn't actually have, th you know, his thinking wasn't quite the way that my thinking was. His behavior didn't seem quite the way my behavior was. Maybe he's not enough like me for me to really extend an invitation to him. Now, granted, I, I, that was just a small fleeting thought, but it was still there. And this is coming from somebody who, whose life was completely transformed, a completely new trajectory of my life took place because I was a part of a church that knew how to invite and welcome in. Uh, when I was going off to college, I went off to college kicking and screaming. I didn't want to go to college. Uh, my mom and dad wanted me to go to college. It was a good choice. I'm glad I made it. But that first year, I didn't want to be there. Uh, but I knew that first weekend, because church was a part of the rhythm and the pattern of my life, I wanted to at least go to a church. And I had heard about this church that was only four months old. It was a church plant. And, uh, and so I thought, hey, this, this is cool. We'll, we'll go to some place that, that's new. And so I had my brother, my brother and I, we went together. And at the time, when I was in college, I, I rode a motorcycle and uh, I had spiky hair and I wore a leather jacket and, you know, I tried to look really, really cool. I, I probably wasn't pulling it off, but I thought at the time I was. And uh, so I showed up at this church and I walked in. And if I'm real honest with you, I did not feel really invited that first Sunday. I, I walked in and I looked around and there were zero college students, like no one my age. There were a lot of families, there were a lot of kids. No one's riding a motorcycle. No one's wearing a leather jacket. And it's like, okay, this is a little awkward. But I sat and I had my helmet and I listened to the music and I listened to a pretty good message. And then I looked at my brother. I was like, let's roll. Let's roll out of here before we have to talk to anybody. And, uh, and I'm about halfway out to the parking lot when uh, both my brother and I, we hear something behind us and we're like, what's that? And we turn around and no kidding, it's the senior pastor, pastor and he's literally running out to us. I'm like, well, this is interesting. And so we stopped and we had a short conversation, but a very meaningful conversation. And at the end of the conversation, I realized that this was a place that I was clearly invited. This was a place that I was clearly welcome. And so we began to, me and my brother both, began to place roots in this church community. And I, for the very first time in my life, I really got a taste for ministry, got a taste for 
purpose outside of a life lived for myself. And, uh, and this church eventually actually sent us off to my wife and I uh, to do ministry in East Watini, Africa. And um, I'm probably here today because of that, that church. How did that happen? Well, it happened because Jesus invites people that others reject. And this pastor at that church realized he had been invited into the family of God and he would do everything that he could to invite others into the family of God. And I was one of those people. I want us to, to really evaluate, not just as an individual. I want it to be as an individual, certainly, you know, that you have been invited into God's family. And I want that to just kind of transform your identity and, and who you are. But at the same time, I want it to be one of those questions, one of those things that you just start to ask yourself, okay, is this the culture that we're creating here as a church? You know, if you're not part of our church, you don't have to ask these questions. Uh, and instead, you can evaluate. You can evaluate whether or not we're doing this. Um, but I want you to ask, are we living the life, are we modeling the life of Jesus? Are, are we intentionally inviting and making sure people are loved and full, filled with God's grace the same way that we have been filled with God's love and his grace? I would love for us to become a church that would be the most welcoming, most loving place that anyone in this community could go to on a Sunday on a Wednesday, any time that we have events, even when we're not having events, that our people would just infiltrate the community and just invite the people that others reject. Yes, let's become a church that truly lives like Jesus, inviting the people that others reject. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for sending Jesus. We know that that's what Jesus did on the cross that really solidified that invitation, that he took care of the sin that really separated us from you. And Father, we don't want to be people that just receives the grace, but certainly we want to receive it each and every day. We want to bend our knees and we want to thank you and praise you for that grace and that mercy, that love, that even when others, they, they reject, when others pick, when others dump, when others divorce, when others do not see the value that you see in us and you you accept us. Father, I pray that that would fuel us. And that would fuel us to actually invite and love and, and be merciful to others, even when they're saying things that we think are a little weird, even when they're behaving in ways that we know aren't really honoring to you, but still in that, loving them closer to you. I pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen.